Last semester, we took a brief look at propagation delay and the issues that it can cause in a ripple carry adder. In this screencast, we're going to revisit the idea and take a more in-depth approach to establishing propagation delays within combinational logic circuits. Then, we'll look at how we can use the simulation tools that we've already worked with to model propagation delay within our designs. When we talk about digital circuits, we often talk about them in terms of being high speed or low speed, but what does this actually mean? When we use these terms, we're actually referring to the propagation delay time of the circuit. The shorter the propagation delay, the higher the speed of the circuit, and the higher the frequency at which it can operate. The propagation delay time of a digital circuit is determined by the cumulative propagation delays of each of its components, and in some cases the physical distance between these components on a chip. In this video, we'll start by looking at the propagation delays of individual components and build upwards into full digital circuits. So each individual component in a circuit has its own propagation delay, and we measure this using two values. TPHL is the time between transition on the input and a transition on the output from high to low, and TPLH is the time between transitions from low to high. These measurements are taken according to a reference point on the transition, usually at 50% between the two voltage levels. The values of TPHL and TPLH aren't necessarily equal. They depend on the inner circuitry of the gates, or rather, the time taken for the signal to propagate through the underlying transistor array, hence propagation delay. When we use these components in our circuits, we have to design for the worst case scenario, so the highest of the two values becomes our propagation delay for that gate. This delay tends to be in the order of nanoseconds for each logic gate. So if each gate has its own delay, once we start stringing them together to form a circuit, we need to carefully manage how we treat the output, otherwise some significant issues can occur. Take this simple circuit as an example. On paper, the output will never equal 1. We're always trying to AND the input with its complement, and therefore both inputs of the AND gate will never be high. However, the physical properties of the NOT gate performing the inversion will delay the signal passing through it, and a race condition will occur at the input of the AND gate. Race conditions happen when the output of a gate depends on nearly simultaneous events occurring at its input, and whichever signal arrives first will change the output. We can draw the timing diagram of this circuit, taking propagation delay through the components into account to determine the result of this race condition. Let's assume that each gate has a 1 nanosecond propagation delay, and the propagation delay through the wires is negligible. We'll pulse A high twice for 10 nanoseconds, and examine the effects on wire 1 and output X. The signal takes 1 nanosecond to propagate through the NOT gate, so the inverted signal at wire 1 is slightly offset. This means that we have two 1 nanosecond periods where both A and wire 1 are high, which will trigger the output of the AND gate. The AND gate itself, however, also has a 1 nanosecond delay, and therefore these brief high states are offset again. These brief flickers of erroneous output generated by the race conditions are known as glitches or logic hazards. A circuit's output is deemed to be valid when all of its output pins have settled outside of these glitch states. Sometimes we can add extra logic to our circuits to account for potential glitch states, although this can often lead to a large over-engineered circuit. More commonly, we specify a time for the output to become valid and ensure that we wait for that amount of time before reading our circuit's result. This worst-case scenario time frame is the circuit's propagation delay, TPD. To determine the time for the circuit to become valid, we need to identify its critical path. A circuit's critical path is the signal path with the maximum delay, where changing an input takes the longest route to affecting an output, and therefore directly defines the circuit's propagation delay. We conduct this process by hand, using our knowledge of the circuit's functionality and examining how the signal flows through it. In the small design given here, we can see that the longest path to the output starts at A and flows through four gates. If we know the propagation delay for each of our gate types, we can determine the total propagation delay for the circuit. Let's assume some arbitrary delay times for the circuits, say 4.5 nanoseconds for an AND gate and 3 nanoseconds for a NOR gate. 
we can see that the signal flows through two AND gates, a NOR gate, and then a final AND gate. So this path's delay time would be 4.5 plus 4.5 plus 3 plus 4.5, or 16.5 nanoseconds. We can see from this example how quickly propagation delay can stack up with just a few simple gates. So what happens in large designs? Well, as we go up the hierarchy, these propagation delays can accumulate further and further. In this example, we've got a bus being split and passed to a few of our small designs with some output logic dealing with the results. We can use the gate delays here, along with our knowledge of the delay of the small design, to determine the delay for a path. But which of these is our critical path? Well, it's not going to be the path that A0 takes, as it's only passed through the OR gate, but looking at the other four, it's going to be a close call. The delays for each of these paths is the same after the small design, 16.5, but the branches then arrive at different gates. The two on the right are brought together in an OR gate, and the two on the left are brought together in an AND gate. Looking at our table, we can see that the NAND has a higher delay, 5 nanoseconds, and therefore these branches are part of our critical path, which, if we add up the delays of the gates and the delay of the small design circuit, comes to 28 nanoseconds. Be aware that technically we have multiple critical paths, as we're using the 12 most significant bits of A here. In theory, all of these paths have the same delay, but in reality it could come down to how the design has been physically fit on the device. So we can now determine the propagation delay of a circuit, but what does this value actually affect? The propagation delay of a circuit determines the maximum frequency at which it can operate. If there's a certain amount of time required before a circuit's output can be deemed as valid, then we'll need to wait for that amount of time before we actually read its output. I know we've been working with asynchronous circuits here, so in theory there shouldn't be a timed aspect to them, but even asynchronous circuits require new input values clocking in, and we can't clock in a new set of values until the previous output has become valid. We can introduce new inputs to our designs on the edge of a clock, either the positive or negative edge. Then, on the next of those edges, we'll read the output. Therefore, the output of the design must be stable before the next tick of the clock. Thus, the minimum clock time period is equal to the propagation delay, and in turn, the maximum clock frequency is equal to 1 over it. So for our circuit, with its critical path of 28 nanoseconds, it can operate at a frequency of 35.71 MHz. As we're dealing with such high clock values, even a few nanoseconds extra delay can completely decimate the operating speed of a circuit. In complex asynchronous circuits, we want to avoid large propagation delays and potential instability around the operating frequency. But how do we do this? Well, we've got two options. Either decrease the clock frequency, which isn't ideal, as we may want to be running it as quickly as possible. The other option is to break the logic up into stages. This technique is known as pipelining, and is the more robust of the two solutions. Instead of having a single big block of asynchronous logic, we break the block down into smaller, more manageable blocks with smaller delays, and add registers to handle the signals at the interim stages. This process allows us to keep our propagation delays down, but comes at the cost of requiring multiple clock cycles to complete a process. We'll take another look at this point when we start to deal with registered logic later on in the module. For the final part of this screencast, we're going to take a look at how we can simulate propagation delay in our designs, using only the tools which we've learnt already. Quartus does have a fully-fledged timing simulator called TimeQuest, but again, it's a huge piece of software and there just isn't enough time to properly cover it on this module. Instead, we can use our knowledge of Verilog to simulate propagation delay in our digital circuits using ModelSim. As you can see here, by including timescales and delays in our designs, not just our test benches, we can trick ModelSim into acting like a rudimentary timing simulator for asynchronous designs. I'm not going to give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this. Instead, I want you to look at the example given here and extrapolate this into some simulations of the designs we've looked at today and those we've worked on over the past few weeks. A word of warning though, adding timescales into design files seems to mess up ModelSim's scripts for automatically combining a test bench's associated submodules, so you'll need to manually add both the test bench and its submodules files in the test bench settings. 
On running these modified design files, we can see our circuit's results taking propagation delay into account. Whilst this method can be handy to identify potential glitch states, it should definitely not be used to derive proper timing information for a circuit. If you end up wanting to work in digital design and you're asked in an interview, this is not the way to do it. We're just doing this today to quickly model the concepts which have been discussed. Don't forget to remove the delays from the files once you've examined them.